and, uh, and then, uh, so it was all about relationships and marriage and sexuality. And then my son spoke as well. And it was just a great day that we had with the men there. So uh, now she's home taking care of the grandkids today. Uh, I was thinking about when your pastor said it's a season of fasting and uh, Lent and all of that. I remember we had a, a family at our church in the States. They were an Italian family and they were a large family. And so at Lent, they came from a Catholic background. And so at Lent, it would, the father would talk, go around the, the family and, and ask them what they were going to give up for Lent. And they were all kids, and they'd come to the one, and the one says, well, I'm going to give up bananas. Another one says, well, I'm going to give up spaghetti. And another one says, well, I'm going to give up this particular toy that I like. And they came to their oldest son, and he says, well, I'm going to give up Lent. <laughs> Smart kid. <laughs> There's always one, isn't there? <laughs> Would you turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4? And uh, we are very excited to be here today because uh, you are the first church that is going to be using our new website called lifegrouponline.com for your small groups. And so that means as a church you are going digital. You're entering into the 21st century uh, of utilizing social media to grow in Christ and to grow together. And so I'm going to speak for a little while, then my son's going to come up and introduce the website that you're going to be using for your small groups on how to use it and, and what you can do with it and, and how you're going to communicate with one another and how it can f facilitate your growing in Christ. So uh, thank you for being the first church. You are our guinea pigs. Uh, so you can tell us everything that's not working. The site is actually being beta tested right now by a number of people. But uh, hopefully all of you who are members received your uh, username and password last night. Now if you didn't, it's because your email doesn't work anymore and you either have changed your email since the last one you gave us or what you gave us, we weren't able to read it so we couldn't actually get the right email which is very common. Uh, so we will tell Robin, who uh, emails that have bounced back to us, and then he will contact you, and then you can give him the correct one. So uh, as of today, you should, be able to, you should be able to go on to the new 1.0 lifegrouponline.com website and uh, start setting up your profile and, and beginning to use it and function in it. So this is a big moment for us. We've been working on this for a whole year, and it's cost 40,000 pounds to put this together. This was a huge ministry launch, one of our biggest projects we've ever done. Uh, and uh, Josh and Shell have been working, burning the midnight oil um, for the whole year. So he is tired. He might fall asleep while he's actually speaking here today. He was up to 2 o'clock last night making sure you got your emails, uh, you know, doing the code behind the books. If any of you are IT people, you know what he's, he's been working through. So we're excited that you're, you're stepping into this. And there are a number of churches now that we've talked to who are actually also going to be launched on this, but you are the first. So I just wanted to share something before Josh gets up and we'll bring the website up and we'll begin to explain it to you. Uh, but as the new year, uh, for us, as we begin to enter into the new year, uh, I was thinking about what is it that is the core of Christianity? If you were to talk to people on the streets and ask them, what is the core of Christianity? Or what does Christianity mean? Or, or what is God? One of the things I think that is quite common is they would say, love. You know, God is a God of love, for God so loved the world. The most beloved verse uh, in the world. And the question is, if God loves us, then why does all this happen? But Christianity has always been associated with the love of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And as Christians, we are admonished in the word, through preaching, through songs, through encouragement, through, through all kinds of people, that we are to love one another. In the church, that person you're sitting next to, you have to love them just because you're a Christian. <laughs> and uh, that's a big challenge, isn't it? 
and the person behind you, and the person in front of you, and the person on the other side of the church. We are to love one another. Uh, and that's what it says in 1 John chapter 4, starting with verse uh, 7. Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. The only way God's love is actually developed and increases in us is if we love other people. So the love of God will never develop in us by listening to sermons and by reading the Bible and by praising the Lord. It only gets developed as we actually love. How do you become a better driver? By driving. driving. Pretty simple, isn't it? How do you become a good kisser? (laughs) Yeah, by kissing. Isn't that true? You see, we all develop by doing. And so as we love one another in the body, in our local church, God's love becomes developed in us. Wow. Fantastic. So we all know this, that we are to love one another. We understand And God goes on to say the way that we are to love one another is sacrificial. Jesus died to show us he loved us. And so the question is, would you die for that person sitting next to you? Don't say anything. (laughs) That's an amazing question, isn't it? That is what Christian love is all about. Now, if it's your husband or wife sitting next to you, you'd probably say yes. But if it's someone who's not your husband or wife, you would, don't think so. It comes between me and them, it's going to be them. <laughs> In reality. Now that's quite an amazing thing to say that we are to lay our life down for one another. That, that's such a high standard and such a huge commitment that God calls his people to live by. We are to love as Christ loved us. Now, it being involved in marriage and family ministry uh, for a number of years, we have discovered that one of the core problems in all relationships is that the reason people find it difficult to love one another, whether it's friends, whether it's local churches, whether it's marriages, whether it's brother, sister, whether it's relatives, doesn't matter what the relationship is, is because... We don't actually love ourselves because we're not content in who we are. If I don't love myself, it's literally impossible to love anybody else. And if I don't believe that I am loved, then I will spend my entire life trying to be loved, which means I am not loving because I don't feel loved. I'm not receiving love. The need is so fundamental to the core of being a human being that we need to be loved. That's how God designed it. There's nothing wrong with that. We all need to be loved. And we all want to be loved. But the problem is we have such broken and damaged self-concepts of ourselves. It's very difficult then to actually love someone else the way God loves them when I'm struggling with just trying to feel good about myself. And so this underlining insecurity that we have about ourselves is a handicap and cripples us from freely giving ourselves to anybody else because we're so afraid of rejection and being rejected and and what are they going to think of me and all these uh, uh, things are floating around in our emotions and in our mind that they become hindrances to actually abandoning and freely loving someone else without being interested in whether we are loved or not. You see, the kind of love that God has is not that we love God, but that he loved us. Who can love like that? 
Can you love someone else who doesn't love you at all? <clears throat> Man, that is hard work. That is hard work. And there are a number of relationships like that. You probably have some of those in, as among your relatives. They're the neediest people in the world. They're always the center of attention and they want everything and they don't give you anything. I don't want them coming for Christmas, but that's when they show up. And they expect that gift from you. But you resent giving it to them because they, it's all take and no give. You understand what I'm talking about? We all know people like that. You could be one of them. Heaven forbid. <laughs> but it's, we all know people like, those are very hard relationships to live with. It's all give, 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 and there's nothing. Well, that's how God is. It's not that we love him, but it's that he loves us. And that's what has attracted us to him. That he loves us in spite of who we are. Isn't that amazing? Otherwise, none of us would be sitting in this room. So, I believe that one of the basic tenets that we need to come to grips with is the fact that we actually believe that God loves us. Because if we don't love ourselves, it's even difficult to believe that God actually loves us. You see? By not loving ourselves, we are continually holding our hands out to people and saying, you can't love me because I actually am not lovable. I'm not good enough, you know, I'm not content with who I am, I'm not happy with myself, and so we hold people at bay. In, in a variety of degrees, some people hold people at bay a far distance, other people allow them in quite a bit, but often we have an area of reservation, we have these no-go zones that we're not going to let anybody in because that's just too private, and anybody gets in there, they'll see who I really am, and that will be the end of it. So we have degrees that we let people in, don't we? Even married couples have private areas among themselves, because even no matter how fantastic the marriage is, there's still some fundamental fears that, that human beings have. So it comes down to, do I actually believe that God loves me? Now, I think we all know intellectually that God loves us. Because the Bible says so, uh, that's why I believe it, and because we sing the songs, and you hear people like me preaching about it, that God loves you. But do we actually believe it? Has it actually changed who you are? That, that faith. Because when you believed that you are loved by God... Now you can relax. I am loved. We have in 1 John chapter 3, just maybe on the same page as what you have, it says, verse 1, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. Wow, what a wonderful statement. God has lavished his love on you. On you. On you. On you. On you. It was you he lavished his love on. And he did that through Jesus Christ. Now, he did that for you. Over in uh, Ephesians, it says in chapter 3, he, Paul is praying, it says, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray, I pray that you being rooted and established in love. See, he wants us to be rooted and established in the love of God. It's basic to our uh, interactions with all human beings. I, I'm praying this that you may have the power with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Wow. Is that possible? Is that really possible for us to know the length, the depth, the width, and the height of the love of God? Well, that's how Paul is praying. 
That's what His will is for you. He wants you to actually know His love for you. He wants you to know that. And to know this love that passes knowledge, so that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Without knowing this, you cannot be filled with the fullness of God. You cannot reach maturity in Christ without you knowing His love. Because we, without that love being saturated into our being, we always will hold God at bay because we're not quite sure what he's thinking of us. What is God thinking of you? What kind of thoughts does he think about you? Because that determines whether you believe he loves you or not. Do you think God thinks you're a mess up? that you just haven't quite made the grade? That you're almost a Christian? (laughs) All of us sin all the time. Let's just say it. Whether it's pride or impatience or road anger and frustration, whether it's speeding or lying or taking the, the pencil from work that belongs to them and not us. Just thousands of tiny ways, isn't it? Thousands of little ways. The words we've said that we shouldn't have said in the course of any day when we're talking with people, co-workers, wife, children, relatives, phone calls, the bank teller, the post office with the endless queue and you only got so much time to get the, you know, whatever it is. Complaints we make when we're watching the news or driving into town to get an a, 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 a errand done. So many words come out of our mouth and we know we shouldn't have said that. You know, I, I like driving fast. You know. And I was, I, was, uh, I was in the States and the roads in the States, you know, every road is like a motorway in the States. They're just... It's, a, it's, a, it's an estate that I'm on, but the road is as wide as the M25. And I pull out there, and you know, I'm thinking Britain still, and I'm, I'm going 50, just, just like that. And of course, the speed limit is 25. Why on earth would it be 25 on a motorway? You know? And there's a woman in front of me who's going 25, and so I got to, and I just out of my mouth came, what are you going to do, die on the road? just came right out of my mouth. And the moment it came out of my mouth, God convicted me and the Holy Spirit actually said to me, Jesus would never say that. (laughs) It's true. He would never say that, would he? But we often think God thinks like we do. And we think that he thinks things about us that he would never think. See, when we're feeling bad about ourselves, we think God is also feeling bad about ourselves. And when we call ourselves names, we think God is calling us those names as well. We tend to... So I just want to read the Song of Solomon to you. And this is a a, a translation of it. And I just want to show you what God is actually thinking about you. It starts out with the Shulamite who represents the church in the Song of Solomon. This is, this is between Jesus, the, the bridegroom, and the Shulamite, the bride, which is the church. So this is an interaction. And uh, it begins out with the, with the church talking to Jesus, to the bride talking to the bridegroom. And in this... She starts out by saying, I know that I am unworthy. Now, very often we feel that way. When we are coming to church, when we're coming to worship, when we have our devotional time, or at any, often, we often feel unworthy. Whether we're praying, whether we're approaching God, whether, he's, whether we're believing for promises, whatever it is, we often feel unworthy. And when we feel unworthy we then think that God thinks we're unworthy. You see how that happens? 
And not only do we think God thinks we're unworthy, we begin to think all the people we know think of us as unworthy too. So we project our feelings onto everybody else, and that is self-fulfilling prophecy, which means we're rejecting them. And then they feel bad that we feel bad. And they don't know how to deal with us. How do you help somebody who's feeling unworthy about themselves? How do you get them out of those feelings? That's hard, isn't it? If you ever had teenagers and they've been rejected by a boy or a girl, that's it, it's the end of the world for them. I mean, they really feel bad about themselves. (laughs) And I don't care what you say, it doesn't change how they feel. Well, it's the same with us as adults. We get hurt, we get rejected, uh, whatever it might be, we, we feel unworthy. Well, that's, we often feel that with God. So what is God's response when we say, I am unworthy? Listen to what Jesus says to the bride, to the Shulamite. He says, yet you are so lovely. Is that what you think God is thinking about you? Do you think that God thinks you're so lovely? Must have been written by a British person. (laughs) Wow. Does God actually think that about me? That's love talk. That's how love thinks. I want you to hear me very clearly. Your behavior, your attitude, your words have no impact on how God loves you. God may be displeased with us, yeah, because of our sin, but it doesn't change his love for us. The Shulamite goes on, which is us, and we say, I feel dark and dry as a desert. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that, I'm feeling, you know, not very good about myself, in other words. She still feels that, even though she heard God say, and God comes back and Jesus says to her, yet yeah, you are so lovely. And so she goes on, she says, please don't stare at me. She's ashamed of herself, isn't she? Don't stare at me. Don't look at me. I, I, got, I got not me knees. <laughs> I got a mold. I got this attitude. I got this complaint. Ah, you shouldn't have complained about the pastor last Sunday afternoon. You know, we think of the sins, don't we? We, th- they get, we get reminded of the things that we've done wrong. And so... Jesus comes back to the Shulamite. And the Shulamite says, I don't want anything between us. That's that's what we want. That's what she says. And then Jesus comes back and says, Listen, my most beautiful one. Does he actually think this about you? Is this the heart of God? And he goes on to say, let me tell you how I see you. Here it is. Here it is. This is the word of God. You are so thrilling to me. Did you ever think you were thrilling to God? Probably not. In your wildest dreams, you never thought you were thrilling God. You know why you never thought that? Because you probably don't think very much of yourself. You might be well-adjusted. You might be a healthy person, have a good self-esteem. But to think that you thrill God, that is beyond our imaginations of what kind of people we are. Wow. You know, in dealing with marriages, 
so often the husband you know, will say to the wife, oh, honey, I really love you. No, you don't. <laughs> Why are you looking really beautiful today? No, you don't think that. What are we doing? We are rejecting compliments. How often do we reject compliments? Somebody goes, oh, that's really a, 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 a nice blouse. Or that's, oh, this cheap thing, I just got a prime mark. <laughs> and we just discount what was just said, doesn't it? We, we you know, ugh. Why do we push compliments away? Because we're embarrassed by them. To think that somebody actually thinks something nice about us, it's hard to take. You're born again. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You've been a Christian for years. Still don't like yourself. Wow. It is our biggest problem, I believe. And then Jesus says, listen, I'm going to make you even more beautiful. He goes on to say to her, my dearest darling, you are completely lovely. Now listen to this. You, you, and you are beauty itself to me. Wow. You. I'll tell you, husbands, if you talk to your wife like this, you'd have no problem with passion in your marriage. <laughs> wow. This is love talk. This is God talk. You see what God thinks about you? He thinks you're beauty itself. And so the Shulamite responds to this love talk and she says, oh, my beloved one, you are pleasing beyond description. So she's starting to get a hold of this. And then it goes on and uh, says, listen to this. Yes, you are my darling. You stand out from all the rest. Even though you're surrounded by the curse of sin, you remain pure as a lily. Do you see yourself as pure? See, the only way you could ever see yourself as pure is if you believe you have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. But because we don't see ourselves as pure, we don't actually believe in the power of the blood. We reserve these corners of shame for ourselves. But Jesus sees you as pure. Wow. Wow. I can open myself up to a God like that. Wow. He thinks I'm pure. Wow. He must be in love to think that. Because love is blind. <laughs> God has been blinded by the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> wow. And we are the recipients of that love. And so the Shulamite responds by saying, oh, your love is unrelenting. Yes. She's starting to get it. And then she says, I'm overwhelmed and I'm undone. She's beginning to believe that Jesus actually loves her. That's what's happening in, in this book here. And then it goes on to say, he says, I have come as you have asked to lift you up. Come away with me, my dove. Come away with me. Now, Wait till you hear this. You're not going to believe it. It's incredible. Jesus says to you and me, the church, he says, let me see your radiant face. Let me hear your sweet voice. 
How beautiful your eyes of worship. How sweet and enchanting your voice in prayer. For you are ravishing me. When we are worshiping this morning, when we're praying, it ravishes the heart of God. That's love. Have you ever thought of that when you're praying and worshiping? (laughs) That you're having that kind of effect upon God? And so the Shulamite, in hearing these words, is beginning to come up in faith. He says, I know my beloved is mine, for he, for we delight ourselves in each other. See what's happening now? The Shulamite is beginning to believe in the love of God. And so now she's saying, I can delight in God. I can enjoy him. But I'm going to let God enjoy me. Why? The only way we ever let anybody enjoy us is because we believe they love us. And so we open ourselves up. That's why we get married, isn't it? I want to be with my wife. I want to enjoy her. Love does this. If you believe that you are loved by God, you can give your life to him completely. Ravishing, ravishing, ravishing. The whole uh, book is about this. And uh, he goes on to say, what pleasure you bring to me. When I look at you, I see your inner strength. Every part of you is so beautiful, my darling. Perfect your beauty. Flawless your love. Now you are ready to come to me. For you are ravishing my heart. You have inflamed my being. My beloved one, my equal, my bride. Listen to this. God says to you and I, I am undone by your love. This is the effect that we have on God. And he wants us to experience the effect that he has on us. I want you to believe that God loves you. God does not see you how you see yourself. He does not. Jesus, that is the great gift of grace that Jesus gave to us. He has colored the eyes of God with his blood, and now he sees us as altogether lovely and pure and holy and righteous and clean and fit and acceptable and perfect. And if he didn't see you that way, you wouldn't get into heaven. You wouldn't make it. (laughs) See? That's what he wants you to see. When we get to heaven, the Bible says we will see ourselves as we are. Wow. Our low self-esteem will be gone. Our self-image will be gone. We will only have a Christ image. But he wants you to have that now. Because if you actually believe that God loves you, now you'll be able to love someone else. Now you'll be able to fulfill 1 John chapter 4, where you'll be able to love one another. Because you're no longer worrying about whether they love you. You're no longer concerned whether you're going to get rejected or is there something wrong with you. You will just be you'll be healed of any shame and guilt and inferiority. That, all that disappears because perfect love cast out. There you go. 
That fear includes insecurity, shame, guilt, all those words that, that push us down. And you'll be able to enjoy your relationships. Because if I am secure, I can reach out to you. God loves you. Completely and without reservation. Without reservation. And you are ravishing to God. I want you to turn to your neighbor and I want you to confess that. And I want you to say out loud, I am ravishing to God. <laughs> Just before my son comes up and we share this uh, website with you and what you're going to be doing for your small groups. I just want to pray for you. Father, I do pray that every one of us, and I include myself in this prayer, that every one of us in this room will come to a new place of faith in your love. That we will let you love us. That we will actually believe your word more than our feelings. More than what other people have actually said to us that have hurt us and damaged us. That we will believe you, Father, that your love is genuine. That you're not faking it. You're not uh, creating some false hope, but you actually mean what you said. That we are beauty itself. And that we are the apple of your eye. I pray, Father, that by the Holy Spirit you would take these scriptures and let them linger in our hearts and minds throughout the day. Bring them back so that we would abandon ourselves to delighting in you and we would let you enjoy us. In Jesus' name, amen.